first thing that I'm going to cover is, is streaming the right thing? Um, is it, is it the right answer for whatever you're looking to do? So I typically say, if you're looking to teach, um, that is a very solid option. If you are looking to show a skill or ability that is niche or unique, worthwhile. Um, if you are looking to create community, worthwhile. Um, I should say all of these, well, I'll get to that. Um, if you have just a plain desire to, that's fine. Or if it's something that you want to do as a way to kind of learn for yourself, that's actually kind of how I started. Um, that makes sense. Things that I would say are not worth putting on stream. Um, if you're looking for money right there, I, I would say it's, that's, that's something to turn away from. Um, people get the misconception that any streaming platform is an instant in for money. And that is absolutely a misconception. And I will tell you a very, very small proportion of any streamer makes any worthwhile money, um, especially enough to go full time. Um, if you're looking to do something in a uh, private forum or something that isn't necessarily for all eyes, um, depending on the content, that's probably not the best way to go. You can technically put stuff behind subscriptions um, so that only people that are paying to watch your content can see it. But at that point, it's not really the right place to be. Um, and just in general, if you're doing it just because it's the thing to do, um, those are the things that I would say are not worth doing streaming for. Um, it's definitely something that I use it personally as a way to grow community and kind of interact with people, um, some way to learn, um, because this has actually been a very big learning experience for me, um, as well as kind of showcasing some of the stuff I do. Um, for example, you know, cycling, Penguin does kitchen, we, or uh, does, <laughs> does kitchen, does cooking. Um, we've done some charity stuff in the past and things like that. All worthwhile endeavors, in my opinion, on stream platforms. Um, so which stream platform? That's a very, very good question, depending on what you want to do. Obviously, I stream on Twitch. Uh, why? Because that is one of the largest platforms to stream on. Is it the right option? Mm, depends. Um, I have a contract with them, so I'm not going to speak bad about them. I will avoid that. Um, but Twitch is the most widely used platform for streaming, so that means you have the widest audience, the largest reach. Um, it means that is the most the place with the largest chance of eyes on. However, that also means it's the most saturated. So it's a 50-50 split of there is the most people, but there is the most people streaming as well. So your percentage of people with eyes on you depends on what you do and depends on how well you do it and depends on who you learn to make friends with and uh, reach out to. Um, the kind of secondary to that would be Mixer. Um which Mixer is Microsoft owned. Um, that is a very different style. Um, they started off as a much more family community style platform, whereas Twitch kind of started as a watch a day in the life kind of Truman show style. Um, so it obviously tells you where the community started. Um, and then there is platforms like caffeine and systems like that. Um, is there a limit on the number of viewers using Twitch? No. Um, to my knowledge, no, there is a limit to the amount of streamers using a certain bit rate. Um, and that's just, you know, general server issues. Um, that's why you'll see at times, uh, either affiliates or community streamers will sometimes have the ability to change the bit rate option of a stream so you can change the quality of it. Um, but that entirely depends on the amount of open spots on the ingest servers. So that basically just, however much bandwidth they have on their side is what's open but there is never i've never seen a point where the amount of viewers has ever been capped now it does mean you might experience issues of lag during high levels of um watching and viewing but that just typically is around esports events or some unique event how are you hina um fair question though um so, and caffeine and platforms are like that are typically reserved for, to my knowledge, I haven't expen I haven't spent much time on them, but it's usually for high level esports gaming and things like that. What is it that I'm using for transcription? Is it moderated? Um, it is a website called Web Captioner. Um, this started because we wanted accessibility because some of our member or some of the members of our community are members of the deaf and hard of hearing community. 
Um, and so we wanted to have more accessibility. And this is basically a screen capture of the Web Capture website. Um, it is moderated in the sense that it will auto filter if I curse or if it thinks I will curse. Um, so it's, it's pretty well done. It is one of the best out there and the most accepted by the community. Um, there you go. Penguin has that for you. Um, and so basically I just have a screen capture of it. I do actually have a document of how I do this. Uh, I don't think it's outdated. OBS has gone through a couple of updates since then, but I'm pretty sure I still have a document on that. Um, because this is, it, it's just a, a measure of accessibility that we go with. Um, <clears throat> but that is a good question. And if you have more questions on like moderation and how it works, um, feel free, go ahead and ask and I will do my best. There are extensions built into Twitch. There are extensions built into OBS, which is the streaming platform I use. They're not as robust and accurate and they typically lag behind. Um, so they're not as on timing with speech um, and they tend to miss words a little bit more or they're not as clear. Um, like this one, I'm able to capture as many lines of words as I want because the web page is an entire page long. Um, how can I get captions IRL for people? Phones. Phones are your best bet. There is many translation and captioning apps on your phone. Um, yes, I absolutely love Web Captioner. It's phenomenal. Um, it is one of the greatest systems because the extensions and captioning programs for things like OBS or Twitch, they don't capture on VODs. So if you ever download your stream or if you ever want to use it later, you will have to recaption it in some other way. Obviously, if you upload it to YouTube, YouTube has an auto caption system. So there's that. But we all know how wonderful YouTube's auto caption system is. So we try to encourage it as much as possible because it's a very simple ad. Um, it doesn't take much extra effort and it helps a lot. And that's actually a great engagement thing, because if you imagine how many deaf and hard of hearing community members there are on Twitch, um, they're typically going to gravitate towards a accessible channel. And so that number is much less. And so you put yourself into a niche group. So, um, <clears throat> accessibility is always a good thing. Um, so let's see, I mentioned if, um, streaming is not the right answer. There are other platforms that you can use that are private platforms. Um, you always have discord, which I know is a fan favorite. They have much larger video and chat capacity now in private calls. Um, it's temporary. We'll see if it stays. I don't know if they have server capacity for it. Um, Zoom, Hangouts, there's a couple others, but those are, I think, the main three favorites that most people use. Um, obviously, there's Skype, but Skype obviously has security issues, so there's that. Uh, I will go into setting up Twitch and OBS in a little bit. I want to go through kind of the barriers of entry to streaming first and what you might need before I get to actually setting up things. Um, I figure that makes the most sense. If you disagree with me, feel free to let me know. Um, I'll do my best. <laughs> um, let's see. So obviously, as with streaming services, there's many different streaming, uh, or as there's different streaming services and different streaming programs. Um, so I personally use OBS because it's open source, it's free, it's fairly basic, and it's very supported. So, um, like I mentioned, I use OBS, which is Open Broadcaster Studio. So, mentioned it's free, it's open source, it's very supported, it's not, I, I say basic, it's not necessarily basic basic, um, but it's easy to get into and learn as you do, um, so you can kind of grow with the program. Um, that's kind of what I've done and I've started advancing as you can see, you know, things over here. This is kind of more advanced techniques in OBS and stuff like that. Um, so that is a very good starting place. A lot of people use OBS. Um, it's incredibly user-friendly. Um, I can, if somebody is interested in learning a real deep dive about OBS, I can reference you to a YouTuber who actually has an entire masterclass on setting up everything in OBS. I will go through the basics of it here in a little bit, um, to kind of give you an idea of how to get started. But if you want to learn the ins and outs and every individual piece of OBS or search for individual pieces, there's somebody with an amazing, um, OBS masterclass. They also have one on one of the other subjects that I will cover. Um, the one that kind of is piggybacked off of that is uh, Streamlabs OBS, which Streamlabs is kind of a, a notification service, or at least that's how it started off as. It actually started off as being called Twitch Alerts, and then it moves to Streamlabs, and now it's got its own form of OBS. Um, it's not partnered with OBS, but at the heart of it, it is OBS. Um, 
It's also free. It's fairly open source. There's a lot less plugins for it, which that is also a thing that I forgot about for OBS is there's plugins. Um, that's part of the open source. I guess that would make sense that it follow off of being open source. Um, and it is straight, uh, linked to Streamlabs. Um, so Streamlabs OBS, very similar to OBS, except it's a little bit more, um, it's more user-friendly in a sense, but it's also um, some of the like top level unique customization items are also cut out of it. Um, so some of the things like I can't use Streamlabs OBS because it doesn't have some of the plugins that I would use. For example, this audio visualizer here, I don't think I could do that in Streamlabs OBS. Um, <clears throat> the big thing that Streamlabs OBS has is it has built in templates um, so that you can kind of just click a button, it'll set up most of your stream layout and you can go from there, um, which just basically means that it's a much faster um, entry into streaming. Um, for example, you know, things like this, you could have a layout, not exactly like this because I made this myself, so hopefully this isn't on there, otherwise I need to talk to somebody. Um, but there's items like this where you can just drag, drop, and be done, and it's a very simplistic uh, starting point. And the last of the three major ones that I would consider the major contenders for streaming programs is XSplit. Um, XSplit is the only not free option on here, um, which does mean it technically has a premium features. Um, <clears throat> I will admit I don't have much experience in XSplit. I do know there are a fair amount of people that use it, um, but most people gravitate towards OBS and Streamlabs OBS. Those are the two that typically are the most used. Um, the YouTuber that I mentioned, EposVox, also has a masterclass on that as well. Um, <clears throat> does XSplit have a free version now? I know they never used to. I could be wrong on that. Like I said, I have not used XSplit before and I have not checked on them. So that being said, um, you have your streaming sites and you have your streaming services. What do you need to stream? Um, depends. Heavily depends. But I will go through everything that I would say is either critical or is worth noting. Um, and you can decide from there. Normally, I would say a microphone is critical. Not anymore. Um, I would say you should have either a microphone or a camera. One of the two is probably pretty critical. Um, however, you always can type in chat. Um, that is typically, you, you kind of need one of the three for interactivity because you should always be interactive in some way, shape or form. Um, obviously before, when I first started streaming, I said a microphone is critical because learning curve. Um, accessibility has taught me that a camera can be just as important depending on whether a microphone or camera is what you use. Um, <clears throat> then, so you're kind of your top two, either or or both is microphone, camera. Then you have lights. Um, lights depend on your situation and I'll go into that in a little bit. And then obviously the one that has become a crowd favorite lately, but kind of is dying out again, um, is green screen. That's, uh, that's, that's a trend that I used to use and I enjoy not having a green screen anymore. It's also very expensive. So, um, and pain in the butt to light. So, uh, microphone. There are two really, or there's one thing to mainly note about microphones, um, is the type of microphone that you're using. Um, this is something that I had no idea when I first bought a microphone and I wish I did know when I first started. Um, there's a condenser and a dynamic microphone. In within those two types, there's different sound patterns and pickup patterns and things like that. I'm not going to pretend like I'm going to go into those because that is far too convoluted. Um, the main two that are worth noting um, at the top is condenser and dynamic. Um, so the difference between those two, um, a condenser microphone is a li little bit easier to drive and set up. And when I say drive, I mean to power. Um, it is a lot more sensitive to sound. Um, so it's a lot easier to have pick up in your audio. It's a lot easier to just plug in and go. Um, condensers are also more likely to have a USB or XLR option. Um, so most of you are going to know what a USB option is. The XLR is the audio cables that you would typically see. Oh. That. that. That right there. Um, that that plug in the back. Um, that's your XLR cable, uh, or that, well, that's not the cable, but that's the plug for it. Um, a lot of condenser microphones do need phantom power. I don't know if that's a universal, but most do need phantom power, which means you will need an external piece to drive them in a sense. Um, 
they're pretty cheap depending on what you want to get um so what i typically would say is a condenser is going to be good for a solo environment um so where you don't have any background noise or anything else to kind of feed into the microphone because they typically right out of the gate give you a better sound quality um but it's because they pick up everything which can be good or bad so if you have a lot of background noise if you have another person in the room which um my wife's stream setup is basically behind me um or if you have cats dogs children might not be the best um however if you do have that environment where it's a solo environment the go-to is typically an at 2020 um that's pretty much the universal go-to um on the other side is dynamic um which is a little bit more difficult to drive because it doesn't pick up as much because it's trying to cut out background noise um so that means it's best for environments with background noise it tops out the condenser in that sense um pretty much all of your dynamic mics are going to need an audio interface though because most of them are going to be xlr cables um i am lucky in the one that i use is both uh usb and xlr um that's not overly common i use xlr anyways um but you typically will need an audio interface to feed the xlr cable into to convert the signal into your computer or whatever you use to capture sound um because obviously I don't think there's a computer out there that can pick in or pick up on XLR cables. Um, if there is, let me know. I'd love to buy it. So, um, dynamic mic, the go-to is a, for me, is a Samsung Q2U because it is a $60 microphone, which is a very low barrier to entry. And if you like the sound of the microphone that you're listening to, that's a Q2U, um, which is this thing here. Um, basically, it would look like a normal stage handheld microphone. Um, and this is the audio interface that I was mentioning. Um, this is a Behringer UM2, um, pretty much the cheapest thing on the market, but it's between 20 and $30. Um, this actually also does include a phantom power, which is what I mentioned, um, on the front, this little button, no, not here. Uh, this little thing at the bottom where it says power and 48 volt will tell you whether it has phantom power or not. Um, and that's on that. So it has the phantom power on the right side. Um, so those are the two main types of mics. We, I, I do have wireless mics, but you probably, that's, we're, we're not even going to talk about that. Um, so things that you would look to have on a microphone setup. Um, you should probably have either a pop filter or a windscreen. On mine, I have a windscreen. Um, and that is so that you can kind of have it off angle and you don't get the plosives and sibilants. So plosives is when you, you know, when you say a word with a P and you kind of close your lips and you blow out air. Um, and sibilance is obviously an S. So whenever you um, have that kind of snake sound, um, it will cut out on that. I'm sure Penguin's going to be happy that I'm actually using her lingo. Um, so having a pop filter or a windscreen, you typically don't need both. You typically only need one or the other. Um, you also usually will have a uh, mic off angle or off axis, so it's not directly in front of your mouth. Um, technically, I guess that depends on the mic, though. I keep moving my microphone, so I keep having to put it back. Um, other things are a shock mount, um, something that will basically suspend your microphone so that you don't get sounds from touching the mic or touching the desk, um, as well as a boom arm. A lot of packages when you buy these will come with pretty much everything, especially for a lower end microphone if you're starting to get in. Um, a lot of like AT2020, I think I found a package for 120 bucks that had a boom arm, a shock mount, a pop filter, and the microphone and XLR cable. Um, so you're talking $120 for the whole setup to get your microphone so that if I touch my desk, you shouldn't get much of the sound from the microphone itself you'll get the sound of me touching the desk but not of me actually bumping any portion of the mic and if you've ever heard somebody bump a microphone you know it's a very unpleasant thing um so the different pieces kind of suspend the microphone from different touches or movements um the boom arm is typically from touching your desk um and then the shock mount will keep the microphone steady so kind of that pairing typically means that the microphone is suspended in all axis so that you don't get any background 
Um, if you've ever seen a audio setup, you'll see that there's sometimes audio mixers, which are these gigantic um, things that you plug all the XLR cables into and have controllers over sliders and stuff like that. Um, that is an option if you are an, you know, an, an audiophile, I think is what it is. Um, but there are um, virtual voice mixers as well. Um, the one that I typically use is voice meter. This helps you kind of control all of your different audio inputs, outputs, and the like. Um, basically, that's a little virtual mixer. Let me go ahead. I will show you what mine looks like real quick. Um, go ahead and switch here real quick. Uh, that's not the one I wanted. I wanted this one. So this will be your virtual mixer. Um, so I have a bunch of different inputs across the top. Um, I have two virtual inputs, three um, hardware outputs, and then two of the final ones. Yes, I know I'm using voice meter banana. There is a better version. It's too convoluted. I don't need the extras. And yes, it is called voice meter banana. There's a voice meter potato, which I don't even want to get started on. Um, so that at least gives you a quick insight into what voice meter looks like. Um, so that's kind of more in depth. Um, I can do a segment on how to set that up. It's very convoluted. Um, if you don't need it, don't use it. Um, the one major thing that I would say, know which way to speak into the microphone. Um, that is the number one thing that people fail in audio is know that depending on what style of mic you get determines how to speak into it. For example, actually, I'll use the other one. A Q to you, you do not speak top down, you speak off axis. Because if you speak like this, it's going to pick up everything. It's going to pick up the plosives. It's going to pick up the sibilance. And you're going to have to filter that out and it's going to sound terrible. So if you speak like this, that's why you see people talk like this on stage or something like that. That's when you get the best sound. Um, if you have like an AT2020, you actually talk into the side of it. Um, a Yeti, I believe, is the same way. Um, there's a lot of different microphone styles and they all have a specific way to talk into them. Um, for example, um, AT2020s and um, Blue Yetis and things like that, they all will allow you to talk into the backside and you will never know you're doing it. I did that for a week, I think, and I'm not proud of it. Um, would I buy a physical or a virtual? Um, it entirely depends on what you're doing with it. If you only have one microphone, then I would use an audio interface. Um, but if you have other items and you have a lot of virtual inputs, then I would use virtual. Um, so like for me, I use virtual because it allows me to separate out my music, my desktop sounds, my microphone, discord, everything. So I can control them all separately. So I do have a, if you ever want to know what different microphones sound like, there is a whole YouTube channel de dedicated to that. So I can give that out if people are interested. Um, that's actually how I picked most of my microphones. Um, it's a great review and I'm not going to be able to touch anything that they do because they review everything and actually know what they're talking about. I will say the go-to for condenser microphones is an AT2020. It has the best sound quality. Um, the go-to personally for me for dynamic microphones is the Samson Q2U, um, simply because it's the, the bang for the buck is amazing. Um, it's a $60, um, microphone with an incredible drive to it. Um, camera choices. This one is actually a tough one right now, um, simply because of the market. So this is kind of a future cast onto what you should do. Um, first off, obviously, is the camera needed? Depends on what you're doing. If you're showing off things in a physical realm, obviously, like I am doing right now, obviously, you need a camera. Um, if you're not using a microphone, probably a worthwhile trade off for the engagement. Um, because if you're not doing one, you should probably do the other because engagement is tough with only, ta uh, only, um, engagement through chat. Some people that's all they have, um, either for accessibility reasons or for monetary reasons. Um, but I would say one or the other is probably useful simply because of the fact that that's a really good way to engage. Um, you, even if you don't want to show your face, there's programs like face rig where you can have a, uh, mascot mapped to your face. So you still get the facial animation of smiling, laughing, you know, being in awe, things like that. Um, but features like that are so powerful for a stream and engaging a chat 
um, that I personally would say it's a very useful piece of technology and especially when webcams aren't overly expensive. Um, so which type? Um, I heavily suggest you don't use a built-in microphone. It is a terrible idea. They're not good with lighting. They're not good with focus. They're not good with general overall quality. Um, everything about them, eh. Um, so built-in camera, I, I wouldn't even begin. Um, if it's all you have, I don't know. I honestly don't know. It, it's, you have to get your lighting phenomenally done to make them work well, just because the quality that you're going to get out of it versus the actual usefulness that you're going to get out of it is very difficult. Um, so on to kind of segueing into Zero's question, um, <laughs> webcam is typically the de facto go-to for most people right off the bat, um, just because it is much cheaper. It's a lot easier to use. There's a very low barrier to setting it up. Um, there are cons to it though. Um, obviously they're very limited. They're, um, the concept in them, which this is ex actually what Zero was mentioning. Um, this is a Logitech Z920. This for the longest time was the go-to. Um, it is, when it was being sold, it was $50. Um, it, shot in 720p or 1080. Um, in today's day and age though, the issue that they're coming up with is that they only shoot 30 FPS, which um, 30 FPS isn't as accepted. It's just kind of a, you know, people have such large monitors and such fast refresh rates that people want better quality. Um, well, actually, you have to get the C922. You can't get the C920 anymore. It's actually not being sold. We found that out the hard way when we went to buy another one. Um, the C920 has been basically discontinued for the C920 streamer and the C922, I believe. Um, so the C920S is the replacement for the C920, and the C922 is their kind of upgraded model. Um, so what the difference is, is the C920S... Um, it just has a security feature on it. And I think it has background replacement, um, if I'm not mistaken. And the C922 allows you to shoot 60 FPS in 720. Um, so the C920S, I think, is like $60. And the C922 um, is 75 on sale, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so depending on what you're doing, this is still the best option out there because you're talking between $50 and $100, depending where, where you get it. Um, and it's... USB, you plug it in, you're done. That's it, you capture it. Um, you might mess with the balance on it or anything like that, but this is, that's it. Um, I will tell you, if you're looking for gameplay stuff, 60 FPS is the way to go. Um, the other option is there is the Logitech Brio, um, which is a 4K webcam, and it also captures in a much wider scope. I believe it's a 90 degree field of view, whereas these are either 68 or 72. Um, so basically you're just capturing more of your room personally i don't care we have a very small studio it's literally nine foot by nine foot um there's not much to capture that is the typical go-to unfortunately they are legitimately sold out right now everywhere um i could not find one to get a representative price right now they are price gouging whoever has them so do not buy one of these right now unless you want to get scammed um they're selling them for an arm and a leg it's not worth it um so the other style is um, something like a DSLR or a mirrorless camera, um, or as Zero mentioned, a GoPro. Um, these all have their places. The main issue you're going to run into is you need something like this, which is a capture card. Um, you cannot natively accept HDMI directly into a um, computer. You can obviously output HDMI, but you cannot accept the output from a camera or action cam immediately without having an intermediary encoder. Um, so there's many different types. That one, I will honestly say, is a pretty cheap Amazon special. Um, it was about $100. Would I recommend it? I don't know. It has some issues. Um, the go-to is typically an Elgato. Um, but the base model for a capture card reasonably is going to be $150. So you're talking the cost of the camera, 
the cost of the capture card, and then anything else you need to make it work. Um, so for example, if you're going with, let's say a GoPro, which we do actually sometimes use, that wasn't the initial intention of it. Um, but you're talking probably $300 minimum for the GoPro. You're talking another 150 for the capture card. Do they have their place? Yes. Um, most GoPros and DSLRs or mirrorless cameras will shoot in 60 FPS, um, at much higher resolutions and much higher qualities. They also typically have auto light balancing and auto focus if that's your thing or you can manually dial those in um if you can't tell i am currently using a mirrorless camera and that is how i am getting the bokeh in the background um you will always know if somebody is using a dslr or mirrorless camera because webcams can't do that if you see this and somebody claims it's a webcam they are making it happen in some way shape or form that is not directly out of the webcam um Right now, I am currently using a Sony A6000. Um, it's a very, very good mirrorless camera for a reasonable price. Um, I think we got ours for $325 or $400 off eBay. Um, it was really, really incredible deal. Um, so, the issues with them. Very hard to set up. Mainly because of the levels of things that you have to understand. You have to understand the capture card. You have to understand what you need from the camera in order to set it up. Um, for example, from a DSLR or a mirrorless, it has to have a clean HDMI signal and it has to be able to be turned off of power saving because there is a requirement on cameras from whatever government governing body um, is certifying cameras that they have to um, power cycle every 30 minutes at maximum. So you have to be able to basically jailbreak your camera to either install something or get to settings that are not normally existing in the camera to turn that off. Um, clean HDMI, that is one of the things that is dependent on the camera. Not every camera has that. And basically what that means is when you are looking through the viewfinder or the back digital screen of a camera, if you notice the battery symbol and the focus and all of those different things, if you don't have clean HDMI, it'll output all of that information to your screen. So you have to make sure that you don't have that. Otherwise, it's going to look really ridiculous. Excuse me. Um, do I use an Elgato Cam Link? Um, no, I use an Elgato HD60. Um, it's one of the older models. It's not one of the HD60Ss. I think it's an HD60+. Plus, I think. How are you, C? Um, the other one that we use, this one is usually mainly used for the GoPro. Um, it was a hundred bucks. It is occasionally iffy. I don't use it for the higher quality images. We've tried capturing like consoles and stuff with this and it gets pixelated. Um, so it, this is a good example of why you buy legitimate. Um, that was more of a test run anyways. It wasn't something that we actually, we were learning at that point. I won't go too much more in depth on cameras, um, because I don't, it, there's a lot to it. If you want more information, I can definitely go into more depth later. Um, but just know built-in cameras are, for me, I would say a no. Webcams are typically the starter option, um, unless you already have a DSLR or a mirrorless camera or a GoPro, um, then you at least have you know a base, but they're very expensive and difficult to learn. Um, so next thing that I mentioned was lights. Um, do you need them? That is also a very heavily dependent situation. Um, if your background is well lit and your face is too, you probably don't. Obviously, this also depends on if you have a camera. If you don't have a camera, ignore all of this. Um, if you have a, any lack of lighting, either on your face or background, you should. And if you plan on using a green screen, absolutely. Even more so. Um, green screens are notoriously painful to set up because of how much they require. Um, I'm not going to go into a ton of depth on lights. I will give you a very brief overview just because lights are... I mean, there's literally job descriptions for lighting. I mean, there's, I mean, there's job descriptions for people doing photography and sound. So I, that's not a good example, but you get what I mean. Um, so if your background is relatively well lit, um, something that I would suggest is still at least a ring light of some sort or some sort of front facing light to at least illuminate your face. Um, I will say Penguin and I have found these. I never thought I would use these. These are like $20 on Amazon. And it's basically a clamp that you clamp onto your desk. 
three different arms. You can get a single ring light or two. I would say get the two because it's not that much more expensive. It has a phone clamp if you need it. Uh, we're not going to use that. Um, and it's USB powered. And then it's literally, you have this little switch here that lets you choose different styles. There's a more yellow, there's a more white, and there's a kind of a fluorescent. Um, and then there's power levels. It, it's it's really impressive for $20, $30 on Amazon. Um, if you want a secret, it's literally what's lighting my face right now. Yes, um, that is why I suggest the two, because then you can shoot from two different directions. That's why um, you use these, and you have one shoot on each side of your face, so that you don't have shot. Um I used to use background lighting, because that's the kind of style that we had, and we had a green screen. Um, so I would say front-facing ring lights or something like that are good if you have a background light. So CE has a very good point. Lights can make a cheap cam look expensive. An expensive cam with no bad lighting look cheap. Um, especially if you have a camera that does not do with low lighting um, or do, does not do well with low light, um, it will absolutely ruin any camera. Um, and like I said, those lights are about 20, 30 bucks on Amazon. Um, so the other option that I mentioned, if you need more overall lighting, um, most people have moved to something like this, which is basically an LED panel. Um, we used to use these to light our green screen. Now they're mainly used for our kitchen scene. Um, these throw a lot of light. They allow you to change what color temperature and the brightness. And they're not overly expensive. But that's if you legitimately need room lighting. If you need room lighting, that's, you know, a good base. Or not, I shouldn't say room lighting. Because if you have overhead lighting and stuff like that, you can use those. Um, but this is if you need external extra lighting. Um, thankfully, we've switched this room, so we have a lot of overhead lights that have made it so we don't need that anymore. Um, but those are a very solid way to determine exactly what color you want, how bright you want them, and where you want them. Yeah, LED light panels are very inexpensive if that's what you need, um, which um, they throw a lot of light. They're great for backlighting. They're typically too harsh to do front lighting unless you get something like a softbox, which there are people that do large softbox lights and things like that. Those are a little overdone. Um, ring lights are perfectly fine, if I'm honest. Um, now, if I don't look well lit, then you can tell me that and maybe we'll talk. But <laughs> um, what those are also mainly used for is things like uh, green screens. Um, so green screens I will touch very lightly on because green screens are very much an extra. Um, it's depending on what you plan on doing. If you need the screen real estate, you have something where you don't want to show your background at all, or you have a place where a background is not an option. Um, the issue with green screens is not only the cost of outputting for the green screen itself, it is also the cost of lighting. Um, the typical recommendation for green screens is at least three lights on the background itself and two lights on the face. Um, you can even up from that and do three lights on the background, two lights on the face, and one or two lights to halo light you, which basically gives you a throw from the back and separates you from the green screen more. Um, it's a lot of work, usually not very worth it. The only other option is a company called Web Around, which does green screens that attach to your chairs and causes you to have to do less work. But then you also have this roving green screen on your chair that if you turn your chair, you're going to really ruin the illusion. Um, most people go to Elgato. They have about a $150 green screen that collapses into a five foot by four by four inch um, box that literally you open up the box, you pull it up and it's done and it stays. Um, if anybody wants more explanation into green screens, I can go more into depth into green screens, but I will tell you the whole lecture on green screens because there's people that have made careers out of that. Um, and I will tell you from experience, they are bit of a hassle if you don't know light like I did I mean didn't I guess <laughs> um so as promised those are kind of the basics of the barriers to, to entry for streaming um I wanted to cover those before I went in depth of actually looking at how do you set up your twitch how do you set up OBS because if you don't or if you're not able to meet those or you decide that that's not worth the effort there's no point in going in depth of another things yet because you're not going to get to that point. Let's see. So I believe we, 
Yes, that is that is very true. That's why I reference when I talk about lighting, I talk about front and back lighting. If your background is well lit, then you need a front light. If your front light or if you're front lit, then you probably want a background light, but it's not as critical. Let's go here. I don't think I'm showing off anything overly critical. I need to remember which buttons I'm on. Um, phone flashlights. Oh god. Um. Oh god. I don't want to see that. Go away. Can I? Hide? Yes, I can hide that. Ugh. I don't want to see myself. Um. So, setting up Twitch. Hey, chef. Um, this is your dashboard. This is basically your home. Um, everything, th this is basically where everything starts and stops now. Um, you edit your stream info here. So this is your title. You go live notification is basically an email that gets sent out to anybody that's following you. Category, category is very important on Twitch. Um, category is a bannable offense if you're not a known streamer. It's not really a much used ban, but you should be in the right category, basically. Um, the audience basically determines whether I'm doing it for subscribers or not. If you're not an affiliate or partner, that's not, that's not applicable. Um, tags are a way to make it so you're, you're discoverable. Um, Twitch's discovery platform is not amazing. Um, it's Definitely, there's definitely ones that do it better. Ironically, YouTube actually does have a better algorithm for discovery. Um, you can go through there, find out all your different tags. That's where I put things like closed caption, family friendly. Um, and your captions can vary stream by stream. You can take them off and put them on as you go about. Um, hosts and raids. Um, hosts and raids are basically just how you support other broadcasters. That's not really important to getting started. Um, let's see. Let's go into here. Insights, I really don't want to go into that because that's stuff that I probably shouldn't be showing on screen. Um, channel points we can go into later if anybody's interested. I have literally done an entire video on that because that's engagement, um, but there's a lot to that. Channel preferences are really going to be where everything's at for starting out. Um, this is setting up the idea of your channel. Stream key, thankfully, that's not as important anymore. That used to literally be your lifeline. Um, you don't have to enter that very often anymore, and you should never show your stream key to anybody. That is step one of being a secure broadcaster. If you give your, if you give anybody your stream key, they literally have control over most of your channel. They can do whatever they want on the front end. Disconnect protection is something that they just um, brought in that basically makes it so that if your OBS crashes or if your computer crashes or anything like that, it will show a disconnect symbol for 90 seconds, so it technically keeps your broadcast live. Uh, there is, yes, but I would not like to experiment with that. It's a lot of jumbled numbers and characters. Um, store, bat, pra, uh, store past broadcasts. This is something that I would absolutely recommend for everybody, regardless of what you do. Um, if you donated $10,000, you're crazy, but sure. Yeah, sure, I'd show it. Um, you'd, gotta, you'd have to donate it to St. Jude, though. Um, store past broadcast basically means that every single time you stop streaming, it will automatically archive your VOD for 14 days if you're in a uh, for an, a, anybody 60 days for partners turbo and prime users which is just basically higher levels of how much you're paying twitch um except for partners that's just kind of a, a status um mature content you absolutely have to make sure that you have this checked either way depending on what you're doing if you're showing mature content or using um mature language and things like that you should have this checked that is a bannable offense for twitch latency mode is something that they just uh, not just introduced, actually been around a year plus. Um, if you're experiencing issues when you're streaming, this is a good way to control that. Low latency means that you see me much faster. It means that when you chat, I get to hear faster and respond faster. Um, normal latency cuts that back, um, but it also reduces the stress on your broadcast. Um... Permissions are something you can dive into if you so choose. That's basically your editors and who can stream. So you can basically let other people stream to your channel. So if you're running, um, let's say you want to run a continuous marathon or a continuous, like a like bring a convention online, um, you can have multiple people have access to your stream so that as soon as you go live, you can stream, you finish your stream, you click stop streaming, somebody else can immediately go live on your stream and you kind of keep this uninterrupted, consistent stream that, you know, perfect for now when you're working from home, you can have five different people go live in succession, um, one after the other, being in entirely different places in the country or the world. Um, 
profile accent colors that's just basically how you differentiate your player banner channel trailers that's all new social links stream schedule this is all brand new stuff this is stuff that there will be plenty of videos on in the future it's not overly important to starting um hosting raids teams drops viewer milestones all of those are not important to starting those are just extra features um moderation is something worthwhile to check into um twitch does have an auto mod system um so that means you can decide how intense you want your auto mod to be which will without having moderators in chat this will help control your chat um you can block phrases you can block words and slurs and whatever you want it to be um there is auto mod rule sets which is basically um you can decide how strong you want your auto mod to be you want to be careful with this though because yes it does seem to work relatively well unless you go too strong on it um basically you have it so that you can either make it entirely erase whatever somebody said never show it or hold it for moderation um which means that you or one of your moderators can approve or deny what somebody has said before they've said it in chat um <laughs> So there's a bunch of different levels that you can set it to, or you can set custom levels here based on discrimination, sexual content, hostility, and profanity. This is a great tool if you're starting out. Um, it allows you to get by early on without having moderators. Um, you can block terms and phrases or permit terms and phrases. So this is, as you learn what automod blocks, you can add items to permitted terms and phrases so that it doesn't block them again. Or... If somebody says something and Automod blocks it, this will make it so that it won't block it again. Uh, yes, you are correct. This is this is that's why it's called Automod versus like C and Penguin being my actual moderators that are actual people. Um, you can have chat automatically block hyperlinks. Um, depending on the community you create, this is good or bad. Um, personally, for me, I've turned them off because I have a very good mod team. And I have a community that doesn't really take advantage of that. Um, it will entirely depend on the community you create that whether or not that is critical to you. Um, Non-mod chat delay, that's basically um, how long is a message held before it shows up. Um, this means your mods get a chance to see a message before it actually happens. Um, you can set this to off to four or six seconds. Basically, six seconds is your mods have a really good chance to catch that before anything is said. Um, and it will just so message uh, <laughs> message deleted. Thank you, Batch. How are you? Um, so channel privileges, you can make it so that people have to have their emails verified before they can actually talk in your chat. Um, chat rules, you can put these in as chatbots. Yes, I do have that on the list. Uh, that is in engagement. Um, chat rules, these are something you set yourself. The Just because you put them there does not mean... Um, chat rules does not mean that they have to be obeyed or that they automatically enforce them. It is something that you can put people on first time coming into your channel have to accept these rules, which then makes it so that once they've agreed to them, you can time out or ban based on these rules. It kind of gives you a little bit of leeway in Twitch's eyes because you've put the rules in front of somebody. Um, well, you're in the Discord, Batch. I pinged the Discord. Um, followers only mode. This is if you have an unruly chat. You can make it so that somebody has to have followed your channel. Um, you can make it so that it is... You can either follow, or you can make it some extraneous, really far out there things. Um, you can get really excessive if you're having a lot of trouble. Um, certain streams will cause you to have more trouble than others. And Batch... That is not something I can fix if you don't get notifications. you got to fix your own Discord. Um, moderator tools and chat. Um, that is, I can show you this real quick. This is a chat bot. Basically, what you'll see is, because I don't have Twitch chat open, um, you'll see icons and stuff like that that help. You can watch the VOD, Batch. You can watch the VOD. The VOD. Um, and then ban chatters is basically you can see who is banned in your chat. Why, uh, sometimes you can see why. Lately, they've added you can add why. I don't know if it... You probably can't go back and see that if you've banned them earlier than when that tool was made. But let's say you have somebody um, contest why they were banned or you want to unban somebody. That will give you um, the options to do as such. Um, Twitch does have streaming tools, extensions, and creator camp. Um, these are all different things that you can look into. 
Um, obviously I have affiliate status here, which I'm not going to go into because as a first time streamer, you will not have that right away. It is an earned status. You have to hit certain milestones. Um, basically a certain viewer count, certain, or certain average viewer count, certain amount of followers and a certain amount of time streamed in a month. Um, what that does is that allows people to then be able to sub to your channel and use bits, basically monetization. Um, it also allows you control. Oh, actually, no, it gives you ads because community streamers don't have ads anymore. Um, <laughs> that's fine. Um, so that's a very brief look into the basics of the backside of Twitch. There's a lot of different things in here. Uh, basically insights will give you, um, a look into your own channel statistics. I don't want to show that on here because technically you're not supposed to show some of that because it does show monetary values and things like that. Um, achievements, Twitch does have them. They literally don't do anything for you. They can be fun if you find them fun. Um, community, you can control the roles of your chat. Um, so this is where you get editors, mods, different things like that. You can control what roles people have. Activity is basically, you know, who's done what. Um, no, it's not my average viewers. There's, there's moned, um, monetary numbers in there, which you're technically not actually supposed to show. Um, channel points is, like I said, something I've done an entire video on. It is an engagement tool. I might get back to that if people are interested near the end of the stream. Um, content is basically how you control things after your stream. Um, video producer lets you highlight things um, or save videos for later, download them, control them in ways like deleting them if you have a stream that you really don't want to have. Um, collections are basically like playlists on YouTube. Um, you can compile different VODs and highlights and things into collections so that people can watch them in one straight run through, or it allows you to then do a rebroadcast on your stream. Um, clips allows me to see what clips are done of my channel and moderate them so I can go view and check on which clips were done if I want to keep them or if I want to delete them, depending on the nature of the clip, some might be deleted. <laughs> um, so that's basically the majority of the background of the Twitch dashboard. Um, there's not much else to it that at least is on a front look. Um, you have your account settings, but that's going to be purely for you and less of for chat. Uh, let me see. Let's go back here. Um, so settings. This is basically the first steps into setting up your stream. When you first install OBS, I'm showing you OBS just basically because this is what I'm familiar with. Um, Streamlabs OBS will have something very similar to this because it is based on the same architecture as OBS. XSplit will definitely have a different setup. The concepts will remain the same, um, but I'm not well versed enough on XSplit to give an in-depth explanation on XSplit. That is something I can probably, I, I have the masterclass that I've talked about. I can recommend that if you're, if you're wanting to. Um, so your general tab here is more for you. Um, this is stuff that is mostly facing your personal direction and not anybody that is going to be viewing. General is kind of your setup for OBS. Output is confirmations and dialogues. Um, so letting you know, you, do you want a confirmation before you go live with streams? Um, source alignment is moving things around in OBS. So that is going to be your different things like your camera or your chat box or things like that. Um, projectors, that is a more advanced feature of showing, projecting your different sources to different screens so you can see them by yourself. Um, for example, while I'm looking at this screen, I have a monitor above my camera that is showing me a real-time view of what chat sees. That way I can know exactly what you're seeing and make sure I'm on the ball. Not always the case. Um, system tray, that's an obvious given. It determines what happens down on your tray. Um, previews, importers, studio mode, multi-view, those are all much more in-depth things that you can delve into if you want to. They're not necessarily to starting, not necessary to starting out. I Stream is one of the first things that you will want to set up. This is basically a much overhauled version of what it used to be. This used to be a lot more uh, stressful um, because you used to have to put in your stream key here and then decide on which server you wanted to stream to. Um, this meant that you'd have to do server tests before you went live and ping different servers to determine which had the best bit rate. Um, this was a frustrating hassle and caused you to end streams sometimes to get a better upload or to determine which ingest server from Twitch's side was going to be better for you. Thankfully, they've made it now where you literally click a button here that says connect 
it will boot you into a browser window where you sign into Twitch and you're done. You basically give it access to say, I allow you to take my information from Twitch and put it into OBS and OBS will then automatically put in your stream credentials. Um, it will automatically determine which server you should be using and all of that. Um, Twitch ad chat add-ons, these are basically extra faces um, that you can have shown in chat. Um, this relies on the viewer having installed either either Better Twitch TV or Frank or Faith Z. Um, basically, this just adds more emotes. Um, it's more or less, you see it here instead. So. Um, output is one of the critical ones um, because this determines how your stream will look for others and whether your computer can handle your stream. There is a whole in-depth explanation on settings in here, and I do not want to go too much in-depth here without giving or without knowing what somebody's setup is because this can very easily make or break somebody's stream um, if you do your settings wrong in here and you do not have the computer to handle it your stream will not run well um, but if you set things too low here your stream won't look good if you have the computer to handle it if that makes sense um, basically this is a very personal setup here and i will cover on or i will touch on the concepts of each but i will not go too in depth into what you should be doing because it's very very dependent on what computer you have um some parts are dependent on what cpu you have some parts are dependent on what graphics card you have it's very dependent on how you're building so first things first if you if you go into obs you will not see this you have to change your output mode to advanced otherwise all of these settings will not appear um the encoder is basically what part of your computer do you want to be changing your stream into something that Twitch and Just Servers can take. Um, if you have a new NVIDIA graphics card, you will probably want to be using NVENC um, because they've got new architecture that allows it to encode much more efficiently um, without taxing your graphics card. And when you have your graphics card encode your stream, it means that your processor is not, which means that you are freeing up your processor to do other things like running your stream. Um, or running the games or programs that you are using on stream backwards. Um, if you have an AMD card, chances are you will not want to use AMD's encoder. I have not used it before, but I have not heard it is great. Um, so you will want to use the H.264 encoder, if I'm not mistaken. I haven't used that in a while, so I had to remember exactly what the name was, it. Uh, name was for it. H.264 is your basic encoder. Um, that is the default, more or less. Um, and that basically uses your CPU to encode the stream. So the differences are, um, <laughs> that's fair. Um, the difference is if you use NVENC or um, Radeon, you are using your graphics card to encode, which means that you have to have a strong enough graphics card to actually encode the stream. Um, for example, I am lucky enough to have a 1080 Ti, which means I have a lot of headroom in my graphics card and I can run NVENC encoding and my graphics card handles it fine. If you have a lower tier graphics card, you probably want to use a lower level. If you do not have a strong graphics card that's NVIDIA, you will have to use H.264 because otherwise your stream will not look good. So that's a very high level explanation of encoders. Um, so let's see. Rate control... I'm not even going to begin to go into that. As far as I know, you should be in CBR because that is what Twitch requires, if I'm not mistaken. Um, Bitrate. This is entirely dependent on what you are in Twitch's eyes. If I'm not mistaken, C and I have debated this many, many times. Um, if you are not an affiliate, you technically should not be going over 3,500 to 4,000. Um, as an affiliate, I believe it was, for the longest time it was lower. Um, basically the bit rate determines how good your stream looks on the other end. If you set it too high, your computer will be heavily taxed because it's trying to do more. Um, so you want to set this at a rate that your computer can handle without killing your computer. So the higher, the better, but don't go too high. I, I've, I've heard 8,000 is the cap for most people. So I err on the side of caution and I set mine to 5,000. Um, keyframe intervals, preset profile, all of these things here are much more in depth than I will even pretend I can give you the information. Basically, if your computer is struggling, 
preset is your first go-to to try to lower how much tax is taking on your processor or graphics card. These are your settings. Pro sorry, profile and preset are your two that will kind of slowly untax your different components. I'm trying to find the word, right words here. Um, recording audio replay buffer. Unless you really have a reason, I typically would not change those. Um, audio, truly, unless you are an audiophile, you should probably not be touching. Um, recording is how you set up to determine what you want your um, OBS to do when you record. You can have it so that you record while you stream. Just know that you are double taxing your system if you do that. Um, or you can just straight record instead of streaming. So you have options in, in OBS to either stream, record, or stream and record at the same time. Um, and this just basically determines what your settings are for your recordings. Um, you can change where it's uh, recording to. You can change which tracks are recorded. You can change your encoder. Mine is set to my streaming encoder, so it uses exactly everything that I've used for my encoder there. Um, for recording, you definitely want to set your bitrate much higher because you are not streaming. You're not sending to an encoder externally. You are keeping it internally on your computer so you can push much harder without your computer lagging. Um, you will always know in the bottom of OBS, you cannot see it down here. Let me go ahead and try to make OBS smaller. Um, down here will be information and this will let you know if OBS is ever struggling. I'll cover that in a little bit though. Basically you can go in here, change the same amount of things. Main thing to note, bitrate can be higher for recording. You won't stress your computer as much. And that's kind of for recording, it's a it's a test. Um you can very easily test what you should be recording at because you're not streaming to anybody. So even if it lags, you can go watch back the recording and determine is it high enough, is it too too high, too low? Am I stressing my computer? Um, audio, you can delve into this at your own peril. Most of this will not need to be touched. Um, the other main thing to look into is video. Um, so basically here, your video will determine um, what you are outputting to. So you can see my base canvas resolution is 1920 by 1080. I am not scaling. So I'm outputting at 1920 by 1080 and then your filters and your FPS values. So basically filtering, just the higher level or the more sampling, the better your video quality is. Um, for FPS, depends on what you want to output at, you should typically either do 30 or 60. Um, 30 is obviously much easier than computers, 60 obviously looks better. Um, however, note that if you are using a webcam that only streams at 30 FPS, changing this to 60 does not make your webcam do 60 FPS, it does not kind of interpolate frames and add frames. So 60 obviously is going to tax your computer much harder because you are asking it to put out twice as many frames. So this just basically determines what does the viewer see when they are watching your stream and what is the max resolution they can watch. Now, if I have this at 1920 by 1080, does that mean that people have to watch it 1920 by 1080? Depending on how nice Twitch feels, on certain days, Twitch will have ingest servers that will allow you to then downscale as the viewer. I do not know if I have it right now. That would be wonderful if I had it right now. It's basically first come, first served. Um, and it will allow you to downscale the resolution. This is um, hit or miss for affiliates and community streamers. Ooh, I do right now. That's a nice touch. There you go. If you click on the cog at the bottom of the video, um, you will see the option to downscale so that you will have lower resolution, which means it's easier for the viewer to watch as they have, you know, slower internet. Um, so just remember that if you have to bank on people not always having that as an affiliate or community streamer, so sometimes it is better to back off the quality that you're sending to Twitch in an effort to make it so that viewers can watch easier. Because if you're pushing out, um, you know, 8,000 kilobits per second, at 1920 by 1080 60 fps and somebody is trying to watch and they do not have great internet they're not going to be able to watch your stream so it's the accessibility side of that as well sure your stream will look phenomenal however people not, might not be able to watch it so just kind of remember the trade-off there that as you push your stream quality higher people will have less accessibility of watching it. you have to have higher level internet in order to watch just because you don't have the ability to downscale um, now you have hotkeys, you have um, advanced, 
basically one of the only things in here is what process level to set your OBS. This just means where is it dedicated um, or how strongly does your CPU dedicate um, availability to OBS. Um, let's see. Stream delay. Um, this is very rarely used. Mainly this is used in like an esports tournament where you're trying to not let people uh, screen cheat. Not a common thing. Um, automatically reconnect if you are having issues with OBS. This is probably worth turning on. I have mine on just by default. Um, this basically means that um, your OBS will retry connecting if it happens to disconnect for any reason. Um, obviously, if you stop your stream, um, then that's a different story. But if your OBS disconnects either because of um, internet hiccups or a struggling CPU or GPU, this will help. Um, so that's the basic settings there. Um, down here, this is basically your statistics for your stream. Dropped frames will tell you how many frames has your has OBS skipped to make sure it tries to keep as smooth a stream as possible. This number, you want it to be zero. Um, play golf with it. The closer to zero it is, the better. And your percentage next to it is how many dropped frames you have versus how many have been sent. So obviously, if I started dropping frames now, my dropped frame percentage would be very small. Um, because I, it's not bad. Um, how long you've been live, how long you've been recording, what CPU percentage um, is being used, um, what frames or how many frames per second you are sending. And this is your signal health basically for sending to Twitch. You can see that I asked it to output 5,000. It is kind of erring, erring on the side of caution and is pushing out slightly more than I've asked. And that's just kind of a catch-all. Yes, um, if you're having very small frame drop, it's not too terrible. However, at the bottom, it will let you know when your encoder is overloaded. Um, it will show you a very nice line of text that says um, encoder overloaded. Um, something like please reduce strain or something like that. Basically, it means you're trying to ask too much of OBS. That means you either need to back off how many, um, how your bit rate, your scaling or FPS or something like that. Um, because it means whatever you're asking of OBS, it cannot accommodate it. Um, OBS is admin. I honestly don't do it and I'm fine. If you run into issues, run OBS as admin. One of the things I also promised I'd talk about is interaction tools. Um, so these are different ways to basically interact with chat, um, or interact with your system in different ways to make something more interesting to either the viewer or overall stream interest. Um, so extensions are, um, something that has recently been introduced by Twitch. Um, basically they've opened up their API from the backend to developers to make interesting little features that you can use, um, everything from... Um, direct integrations with games. Um, so let's say if you're playing Player Unknown's Battlegrounds, you can have a widget on screen that basically shows what round you or uh, what um, player count is left, what circle you're in, what kind of armaments you're using at that moment in time, things like that. Um, there's also you know captions. There are chat interaction tools where it gives you a survey on screen that is kind of a way to keep chat interactive. Um, there is on stream games for when you're on a be right back scene or something like that. Um, there's a ton of different extensions that are available, um, that basically allow you to do most things that you could possibly imagine. And if not, there are devs working tirelessly at many different things. For example, the latest thing is, um, I know they have opened up source material for channel points so that, um, devs can start working on integrating um, channel points into extensions and extensions can be used either on screen something that kind of is in your face if you look um, over there there's probably a little fly-in um, for sound alerts um, that's an example of an extension and extensions can also be used in info panels down below the stream which might change slightly because those are getting an overhaul so extensions there's a lot in there there's a lot to do um, as you saw i briefly touched on it um, when I was showing you the dashboard, but there is an extensions page. Um, basically, there, if you can imagine it, it probably exists in some way, shape, or form. Um, so, Streamlabs, um, that is uh, basically the system for tracking follow subscriptions, tips, etc., hosts, raids, um, and either showing them on screen if you want them showed on screen, or at least letting you know that they're happening. 
Um, it's an external program that you then bring in via an overlay into your stream and you can set up exactly how you want it. You can use default setups or you can do what I've done and make them custom. Um, that takes a lot of time and effort. That's entirely up to your choice. There's a whole in-depth way of doing that they can get as really as fully fledged in depth as you want them to be or they can be very simplistic text on your screen um uh yeah that's that's an entirely plausible situation like i said you'd have to have them captured in an external system unless they were not streaming themselves and wanted to stream through Lightstream or something like that um so actually the next thing on my um interaction tools list is discord um, a lot of people do know about Discord because it's grown in popularity, but basically it, it is an external um, chat and video server program that allows you to set up communities via voice and text. Um, so you have text channels and you have voice channels that allows people to kind of interact in different ways, shapes, and forms. Um, text, video calls, whatever. Or audio and video calls. I guess text, video, text calls doesn't make sense. Um, sure, send ASCII back and forth to each other. I don't know. <laughs> um, but that is a very widely used uh, community program. It does not necessarily integrate with stream unless you want people to be on your stream via audio or video that you can then capture into OBS. Um, so for example, if you're playing a multiplayer game, you can bring people in via a voice call or if you are doing a presentation or a panel. Um, you can use a voice or video call to either hear or show your presenters. Um, obviously, they do not have control over your system when they're doing that, but they can at least be present. Um, you, if you do a private video call, technically they can show their desktop, so there is that possibility to have control over your stream in that sense, that they can show their own screen, um, but then you don't have control over their screen. So it's kind of hit or miss in that sense. Um, there are also Discord bots that do a bunch of different things for you um, that can help your at least because most of this for Discord is going to be off stream interaction. Um, but that is the best way to kind of build community in a lasting sense um, because it gives you a place to then tell people that you are live again or what you are doing in the future and planning on future projects. Um, so Discord bots kind of facilitate that a little bit easier. It assigns roles. Um, for example, I use one that lets people know when I go live. Um, so whenever I go live within two minutes or so of me going live, it'll post in Discord that I'm live and let people know what I'm playing, what my title is, and, you know, basic information. So that also links into chatbots. Um, this is something C mentioned. This kind of helps with your moderation. Um, I personally use Streamlabs chatbot. You can tell Streamlabs goes through most of what I use except for Streamlabs OBS because I'm not a fan of it. You can have a chatbot in that sense where I have built in um, commands, I have built in timers, I have built in quotes, um, counters, things like that. So um, if you want your, uh, if you want to have something easily accessible in chat, um, you can set up a command. Yes, there's things like that. Um, actually, you know, this is probably something that's worth showing on the actual screen. Um, I almost hit the add button and that would be horrible. Uh, so here we go. I briefly showed this on screen earlier, but you have the ability to add commands. So basically if somebody types in exclamation point ASL and it is enabled over here, it will spit out a certain response. Um, you can control who has permission to it. So it can be only your moderators have access to typing in this chat or in this command, or you have, you know, subscribers or regulars or whatever you want to classify your different viewers as. Um, you can see I've done a lot over the time, but I've used these things for like three years. So I've built up a lot. Um, you can have timers where there are certain things that after a certain amount of chat messages or a certain amount of time has passed. Um, timers are basically after a certain period of time has passed or a certain amount of chat messages, it will pop that message into chat for you. Um, so if you want it to um, basically use certain messages to explain what you're doing or certain social media platforms or things like that. Yes, I do not have these organized into certain things because when I initially started using this, they didn't work. You can have quotes and other quotes and song requests and cues and counters. Basically, this opens up a whole world of different things that you can do um, that make life a lot easier. 
like Fatman is mentioning, you can make it so that there are categories. So if I am streaming to a certain category, only certain timers or um, commands will work. If I'm not live, let's say I have um, Penguin does cooking. So let's say if we are not in a cooking stream, if you do exclamation point recipes, it won't work because you want it to be limited to only that stream type. Um, so there you go. Um, let's see go back to chatting screen so that is um, an example of a chatbot there are a ton of them out there basically it is just a quality of life measure it gives you a lot more flexibility to either have viewers handle their own questions if you have something as a request or a uh, command or you know lets them kind of interact with the bot so that if you're doing something that is particularly focused on the screen or that doesn't let you divert your attention as much they have something to keep themselves occupied um, if you have more questions on that, let me know. I know that kind of is convoluted. It really depends on the bot though. Different bots do different things and are easier or harder to use depending on what you want them to do. Um, obviously I mentioned this before, captions, that it's an accessibility thing. Um, basically accessibility is king. Um, the more accessibility you can add to your stream, the more people you can cater to. Um, so, I mean, that's kind of a basic concept there. Um, Interaction tools that are very widely used and are very widely known now. The the king of of these Dream Deck. These things are wonderful. This is penguins that I stole from her uh, penguin PC over at the kitchen. Um, I am currently use, using one to run my stream, but basically what this is is a series of macro buttons. These are literally a godsend. Um, so you can map different buttons to different things. Uh, I mean, I might be able to pull mine up here to show you. Um, yes, you can never have enough stream decks. Yeah, I can't really. My cord is too short right now, so I can't really show you mine. Um, but basically, these are all LCD screens, and you can program them to do different things, such as starting your streams, starting your programs. Um, you can have folders. You can have them. Um, I've seen that you can have this run service now, which is such far cry from a stream thing. It's kind of funny. Um, just pull up the software. That's actually a fair point. I could pull up the all right, go back to this scene. So, um, this is basically my main screen that I use during streams. Um, you can see these are my different um, overlays. So if I, oh, hit this one, you'll see down here that this is lit up and then I can come back. And it just basically triggers the different scenes. Um, I can turn on or off my mic. I can play or pause the music with this button down here. Um, I can handle Discord things here. I should not. Um, I can end my stream, which is a very dangerous button. I can control my lights, voice mod, XCOM, um, and chat commands. So I have all of my different chat commands in here. Um, you can have your main scene here. So like I have, this is basically before I go live, I can see what time it is currently, how much CPU usage percentage. And then there are multi actions. So this um, button here actually has 15 nested actions. So basically when I hit that button, it does a lot of things, a lot of things. Um, launch stream also does a bunch of things. And basically these are just kind of a nested step of telling it what to do and how to do it. Um, and you have endless options over in the corner. And there are also open source plugins here. How did I do the animations? Um, HitFilm, HitFilm Express, which is a free program. So um, I think what Zero is mentioning is this. This is something I made myself, and that is purely just made off of HitFilm. Um, that takes a lot of time to do. Basically, um, Stream Deck, the whole concept of it is macros. Um, they have three different sizes. There's one with six buttons, one with 15 buttons, and what is it, one with 25 buttons, I think? Um, all obviously ranging in price. Um, small is usually $100, medium is $150, and the XL is, I think, what, $250? Is it $32? Okay. Yeah, it's $32. It, usually you're not going to need the XL. The XL is if you're using it for pro productivity. Um, people use them as macros for um, design programs or video editing programs or whatever you can think of because you can make them do hotkeys and things like that. Basically, as a quality of life improvement, I will tell you the things that they could do is measured by your imagination. 
Um, I've seen somebody sit there and make one button literally pop up every program and put it all over their four different screens. The other thing is they also have Stream Deck now for iOS and Android, so that is instead of paying a one-time fee, you pay three bucks a month and you can basically have a Stream Deck on your phone. <laughs> Does basically mean your phone is condemned to just doing that. So depends on what you're interested in. Um, and the last portion is music. Uh, music on Twitch is a very critical thing because DMCA is a very real thing. Uh, there have been people banned. It's not a very common thing, but you don't want to take the chance that you find an artist that actually wants to ban people. Don't be one of those people. Um, so there are a couple of different options for music. Uh, one of them that I know a lot of the people here in this chat use is Pretzel Rocks. Um, or Pretzel call it whatever you want basically it is a system that allows you to use music that is uh permitted by artists to be used on your channel um basically what happens is if you use music that is not um copyright free or approved to be on your channel um your yes your vods will be muted which means when you go back and try to watch sections that have that music will not be usable um so just make sure that you know that is a real thing that happens uh, stream beats. I'm not. I'm not familiar with stream beats. So, um, that's a good one to know. Stream beats. Um, personally, usually I use Monster Cat, which is a lot of EDM style music. Um, some of them are more mainstream, and it is a licensed system. So I do pay five dollars a month to have both my YouTube and Twitch be allowed. Basically, that means if you normally use Monster Cat, you will be muted. However, if you pay for the license and whitelist your channels you will be able to use it without having an issue it is also that if you cancel your subscription at any point they do not go back and blacklist any of your uh vods so it's kind of nice is there a streamline process endorsed by twitch the main one that is honestly endorsed by twitch is pretzel um that is one of their own suggestions um because they are not at the whim of dmca it is purely on the whim of the artists um, the artists are 100% in control of that, and an artist will go to Twitch and say, I want this music or this uh, streamer band, um, or I will pursue. Basically, Twitch is responsible for you using the music, um, so they try, or publishers, yes, that's true. Um, they will typically try to curb the issue before it becomes an issue. Um, Pretzel, the good thing about it is, um, and C is... C, is pr C and Fatman are probably better uh, equipped to talk about this um, because they both use it. I have not used it. I just understand the concept of it. Um, but there is a bot in chat that will tell you what music is on. I don't know. Uh, C or Fatman, can you request from the bot or is it just telling you what's on? But as far as I know, Pretzel is a very easy to use system. It is fairly straightforward. Um, it's a much better solution. It can do requests. Okay, so th it can do requests and there is a library that is approved to be on streaming platforms, basically. Um, so you will never run into an issue using Pretzel um, to cause issue with either muting or DMCA. Um, and you don't have to deal with things like Spotify where um, you might get an ad during your stream. Um, that used to be a big thing that people had. So yeah, music, honestly, if you are a smaller streamer, it's not as common of an issue but it is kind of one of those things that you play at your own risk if you use copyrighted music um and twitch kind of lets you know that it also um if you ever have a clip or a vod that is a very well received clip or vod if there's copyrighted music in it it will never go anywhere because nobody will be able to use it so questions now i can get to them because i've done everything on my own sheet um so one of the first ones was security um, security is a very real problem on streaming platforms. Um, I will say that there have been streamers in the past that have not been too careful about things and they have been, you know, either swatted or hacked or DDoSed or things like that. Um, the biggest thing is just being reticent of the information that you're giving out. For me, there's a reason I don't use my real name. Uh, for the longest time, I didn't use Facecam. Um, I do not reveal my current employer. Um, I reveal my past employer, um, but not in any depth that would reveal too much. So, for example, pretty much nobody that in my main chat knows um, what I do for a living. I will very carefully pick 
what is in my background or what is shown on stream. For example, off to my right, I have kind of my brag board in a sense, which sounds really corny, but basically it's a board of accomplishments that I use as kind of my own personal hype. Um, I look at it for streaming and inspiration and stuff like that, but it will never show up on stream because it has things that are very carefully attached to um, either a past or something that can be searched and give information on. Um, does that mean things will never come up? No. Um, there are people that unfortunately are very dedicated and will do everything in their power. Um, um, I don't think there is at a normal level. For partners of Twitch, I would imagine there probably is somebody. Um, but for the average everyday streamer, I don't think there is. Um, it's kind of a self self uh driven thing um oh one thing i also do is i don't ever show outside um you will notice i will never have windows in any of my broadcasts because i don't ever want anybody to see directly outside where we live um that way people can't identify um i did have somebody or i did hear somebody mention that um if you buy a house don't um show a walkthrough of your house um, because a recently purchased house will have to have its floor plans readily available online, and there are crazy people that will go search. The best thing you can do for yourself is kind of be secure in what you show and what you say, um, and then have really good moderators in your chat um, to try to curb information that might be shared in chat. For example, a lot of my moderators know some more sensitive information so that they know that they should ban it if they see it. Um, the other thing, there's two sides of the coin. You can either ban on site for things that you don't want people saying, um, per, such as personal name, location, things like that, or you can pretend it doesn't exist or tell them they're wrong. Um, those are kind of the two ways I've seen it handled. Neither are great, neither are awesome, and neither work 100%. Because the banning tells people that it's right. The ignoring doesn't always work. It's kind of a twofold side of you have to be careful of what you share and show, um, whether it be um, your personal environment that you're in, um, things that you say about yourself, your environment, or your situation, um, or things you show on screen. Um, all of them can cause you to have security issues. I will tell you in three years of doing streaming, I don't think I've had a a real issue um, because we are very careful of what we say do and show um, the more you show that has more information the more likely it is to become an issue um, and it also stems into the community that you breed um, if you have a good community usually they will back you up as well um, so I think that's the other side of it yeah um, definitely if you have something revealed in chat that you don't want revealed uh delete any vod and clip of that situation because otherwise people will go up go back and find it you have the ability to delete vods best use of chat chat is definitely it's very heavily dependent on not only how many viewers you have but also the type of community you have and how good your moderators are um personally i always would suggest um a moderator to start is not a bad idea um but don't flood with moderators because moderators can cause just as much noise as um, it can cause just as much noise as having a busy chat. Um, your moderator team is useful, but should only be as visible as needed. Um, one of the big things is the streamer should set the example for what the community should be like and what is allowed. And noise often comes from not setting the stage for what's expected. Um, so on the chat side, they've introduced things like channel points where you can highlight a message now, which kind of helps. And if you use that in the right way, that can kind of help get a message across. Um, the adding lets you, lets the streamer or whoever you're at um, see a highlighted message so you know that it's important. Um, and just kind of setting the stage for what's expected of your chat through both your chat and your moderators. But noise is definitely... It depends on how popular the chat is. Um, some people, if it's a very busy chat, will use subscriptions and tips for actually answering chat. Not a huge fan. 
Um, some will use um, interacting on a external social platform, um, such as either Twitter or DMs on Discord. Um, there are features built into Twitch. Um, like there's, I think, something called Featured Comment, um, which allows you to pull a certain comment and use it for later. Um, or example, like I had, you know, with my moderators here, keeping an eye on key comments or topics that might be worth talking about. Um, yeah. Um, for example, we've had a couple of front page streams. And what I will typically do is I will meet with the moderators before we ever have the stream and kind of lay out the goals, expectations, and hopes. Um, being very real about them. Because obviously most moderators on Twitch, like I mentioned, are not paid. They're people volunteering their time. So um, they're one step above being a chat member. Um, and you have to realize that and respect it. Um, it can be tough. <laughs> um, and sometimes it requires adapting on the fly, like Penguin mentioned. Um, yes. Um, like I said, I would suggest at least one to start. You can always scale up. The key is... A moderator should always be a trusted member. Um, your moderator team should never be an untrusted member. Promoting somebody to a moderator just to have a moderator is probably just as bad as not having any mods. Um, I would say it's, it's critical to trust every single member of your mod team and to know that they are going to do exactly as you ask. Um, so it's, it's a tough balance. Um, if you come into a situation like a brand new stream setup with a moderator, it's a great thing. Or if you have a team of people that you can kind of exchange. The other thing is to also note, because they're volunteers, they won't be at every stream. So you have to plan accordingly. So I have a certain mod team that I know, depending on what time of day I go live, I will probably have somebody around. Um, if that makes sense. But your moderator team should always be somebody that you trust. Any recommended resources for learning how to be a good moderator? Ooh, that is tough. Um, honestly, the best solution is talking to somebody who's familiar with moderating. Um, personally, I don't know of a website or document or anything like that that really outlines it. The best thing is, yeah, I think that would actually be a really good one, is having Penguin actually do a series. Um, because I personally don't mod many channels because most of the time I'm streaming. Um, I have modded for people in the past, but most of the people that I mod for, it's not a necessity. Not only talking to the moderators um, that are successful and know how to do it, but also at the same point, the best solution to be a good moderator is to follow the lead of the streamer. Um, the streamer should set your expectations and they're your best moderator in a sense, I guess. So for example, my moderators know if I have a troll come in um, and is trying to be questionable, as long as it's not harmful to anybody involved, they know to let it be. If it ever gets to the point where it is racist or homophobic or anything like that, they know to ban it in a heartbeat. Um, the streamer kind of sets the role for what a good moderator is. Um, and when you're initially starting out, the best thing you can do is have a constant dialogue. Whether that be, you know, when I was starting out, it would be having a conversation before and after a stream so that, you know, we talk about what the goal of being a moderator is. You have the stream and then after you kind of follow up and say, here's what I saw. Uh, or whether you have a side conversation in a program like Discord. Um, yeah, that's that's actually a really good useful tip um, is the chat commands and behind the scenes stuff. Um, the other part of it is you know, like I've had open dialogues with chat or with a, with a moderator before as a streamer. Um, and sometimes that's necessary um, because there are always going to be situations where either the moderator or the streamer doesn't necessarily know what the right answer is. Um, whether it be somebody come in and you're not entirely sure what their intentions are. And sometimes your mod is more aware of that because they can go into chat logs or see what they've done or who they follow. Um, and sometimes it's the streamer that knows what wants, what they want to have done, but the mod doesn't in that situation. Um, but yeah, I think that could actually be a really good series for, uh, some of my mods. Like Penguin, um, and C and Fatman if they wanted to. Um, that's because I will honestly say the only thing that I, I know is what my mods do. 
<laughs> I have very, very good mods, so I'm thankful. Um, so yeah, I will I will take that into consideration, and maybe we do a mod series. Um, how do you stay? Ah, uh, yes. How do you stay motivated? Um, that is a very, very good question, and I will tell you, don't push yourself. Um, if you don't do this for a living, listen to your mind and your heart. And I know that sounds corny. Um, always do what is right in your mind um, and by yourself because you are your biggest critic and you should always know that you're your biggest critic. So take that accordingly. If you find yourself unmotivated, um, like I mentioned, I have my hype board. Um, sometimes I listen to my own music beforehand. Um, and depending on what the stream is focused on, I always try to put myself into um, the community shoes. For like example, during this whole work at home thing, um, I am motivated by the sense that I am providing a distraction. At least I hope so. My antics sometimes are more of a distraction than anything. Um, so focusing on what your purpose is and remembering that for like me, as odd as it sounds, I'm an entertainer. It doesn't feel right some days and I don't know if I really like that title. But for all intents and purposes, kind of what I am. Um, it's kind of what I do. And my job is to take people's minds off of what's happening in the world. That's why for nine times out of 10, unless it's a specific stream, um, politics don't happen in my stream. Uh, world series, not world series, I'm not talking baseball. World happenings don't typically come up in stream unless it's kind of an organic conversation that should happen. Um, I won't shut things down, but I don't bring them up. Um, my stream is an escape. And so that is my motivation is I'm trying to create an escape for people. Um, if I'm honest, one of the main motivations that I can there that I keep going for myself is I look at it in the concept that I love doing my charity work during April and May. And so if I don't stream year round, I don't have an audience for April and May. <laughs> um, but like for Zwift lately for my cycling streams, my motivation is seeing other people get engaged with it. Um, so it's find what drives you and use it, but don't push yourself because you don't, and this is going to sound horrible and I'm sorry, chat that's been with me for three years. You don't owe anybody anything, nothing. And if you start thinking like you do, then you're going to demotivate yourself. So you always want to think like you are doing this for a reason, but it is not because you owe anybody anything. Um, I look at it as I'm thankful that people are here. So, um, and then the other side, balance life with family, personal school and work. Oh boy. So balance, balance is a very difficult thing depending on for like Penguin and I, um, seeing as she's my wife, um, it's, I, you know, I kind of soundboard off of her and I see, you know, what is, how long should I stream? When should I stream? And we set an expectation. That's why I set a schedule. Um, so I know when we should schedule around things. And if things don't happen the way they should, like let's say we had our anniversary or um, there's something that comes up on the calendar. Canceling is an acceptable thing. You know, life should be first um, because this is a hobby until you go full-time. Don't go after this thinking you're going to go full-time because 99% of the population is not going to go full-time doing this and will not make enough money to do that full-time. Think of where should your time be invested? Um, don't stream all the time because that's not healthy. Um, don't put stream over life. And obviously work is up there too. So it's finding what makes you happy. For me, this is my escape. Um, this is my time to help other people escape. Um, so I kind of see this as my life and personal. Um, I've incorporated Zwift, so like my cycling. Um, so that means that I can work out while I'm with chat, which is a win-win on both sides. Um, because not only do I get my fitness, I get to stream and I get another stream in. Um, so it depends on how you balance things and how you see things. Um, but I will tell you, this should never take over for life, personal or work. Streaming is the last piece. Um, the only time I throw that out the window is, like I said, during charity season, because that is technically for life. You're raising money to help people live. So that's the one time it kind of goes out the window. Um, but always remember whatever you see here. 
there's hours and hours that go on behind the scenes. For example, even on this stream, I have, I'm, I'm gonna pull, pull back the curtain. I have pages of notes, pages and pages of notes. So even for a stream like this, it's a lot behind the curtain. <laughs> so always remember whenever you do something, it's always a lot behind the curtain. So, but yeah, so if you have any questions after this, either on something that I talked about that you want more explanation on, um, or if you come up with something between now and when we do, you know, the moderator panel, um, or anything in between, feel free to, if you're not already following me on Twitter, you can follow me on Twitter and send me any questions you have there. And I will either address them, you know, either if it's easy to do in a tweet, I'll address it in a tweet or I'll do it in the next session that we have, um, or anything, you know, whatever goes, I, I truly do. You know, I said I was nervous before this, but it's because I like teaching about this, but I don't want to spread misinformation. So I try to only talk on the topics that I know I know about. And sometimes that means I have to kind of skirt around things that I don't know about. Um, so definitely either shoot me a message on Twitter, or if you have me on Discord, you can send me messages on Discord. Regardless, hopefully you guys enjoyed.